Oh, I can see. Okay, I think that we're live. Hi, everyone. Um, it's very nice to see you all. I'm Ranji Khanna. Um, I uh, am a Duke Un professor at Duke University, and I serve on the Meridian's um, uh, board, editorial board, uh, at the moment. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this session with Indapal Garewal and Amrita Basu. Um, uh, we are going to be discussing today uh, the September 11th feminist archive uh, that was in uh, the, uh, the Meridian's 20th anniversary reader um, and, uh, and some, some questions that emerge from, from that moment. And I thought I would just start off by briefly introducing um, Amrita and Indapal, who in many ways need no introduction. Um, let me start with um, Amrita Basu, who is Professor at Amherst College. Um, she holds affiliations in the Department of Political Science, Sexuality, Women's and Gender Studies, Asian Languages and Civilizations and Black Studies. Um, she has done an enormous amount of work that has really shaped, um, shaped a field um, in terms of thinking about uh, um, uh, democracy in terms of thinking about protests and um, modes of activism um, uh, that are both understood in local and global terms. Um, uh, for example, uh, the, the book Violent Conjunctures in Democratic India, um, Two Faces of Protest, Contrasting Modes of Women's Activism, in India and numerous um, edited volumes um, like The Challenge of Local Feminisms, Women's Movements in Global Perspective. Um, and it's a real uh, privilege to be to be chairing this panel and, and to meeting you for the first time, actually, Amrita. Um, uh, to briefly introduce um, Indapal Garawal. Um, uh, Indapal is, is uh, Professor Emerita um, of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Yale University. She has also taught at the University of California at Irvine and at San Francisco State University. Um, and um, I, I, again, has really been so fundamental, uh, her work has been so fundamental in shaping the field of gender, sexuality and feminist studies um, over the last some years. Um, uh, her very influential book uh, with um, Karen Kaplan, um, uh, on transnational and post-colonial feminist theory is, of course, particularly important for the development of, um, of, the, of transnational feminism, um, uh, such a key term for, for Meridians um, as well. Um, and uh, she is uh, the author of, um, of, of numerous, numerous books, um, uh, including Home and Harem, Nation, Gender and Empire and the Culture of Travel, um, uh, with Karen Kaplan, The Introduction to Women's Studies, Gender in a Transnational World, um, Transnational America, Feminisms, Diasporas, Neoliberalisms. Um, and it is a, um, a real pleasure to see you again um, in the fall after, after, after some time. I wanted to just start off our conversation by asking you how you came to edit this um uh, what was a special section in the third um the third volume um of uh, of meridian so right at the beginning of meridians really you know just uh, um uh, in in the third volume um uh and to think of this to think of this already as an archive right it's a special section which is really um, announcing itself as a feminist archive um, set in, um, of September 11th, just just um, just very soon after after the events of September the 11th. We'll come back to that idea of an event in a moment. Um, but I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about how you came to do that together with uh, Kamala Vishveshwaran and Paula Giddings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The first is I met Indipal and Paula and Kamla 
um, was at our inaugural event of Meridians. I remember a wonderful day um, gathering at the Sophia Smith Collection, a dinner in the evening, um, in which we became friends and got to know each other and remained with, in touch with each other after that. And I, I don't remember, in the file, maybe you do, how the feminist archive came to be, but I, I just recall it was a product of our conversations at the time. And um, continuing anxieties about U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. I think, yeah, I, I remember, I remember that uh, event with, you know, it, it, it seems like, like a long time ago and so much has happened, but I think it was a moment where we felt a kind of urgency. Um, Meridians was getting formed. Um, it was a moment where the, the U.S. was entering all these new kinds of wars around anti-terrorism in a very particular way, and there was very little feminist conversation about it that we thought needed to happen, and we needed to gather this archive for people to remember uh, what it was that animated our urgency and why it was so important for us to discuss these things, you know, this this new kind of war. Um, and, you know, I had known Kamala Vishweshwaran forever, and so it was really, um, you know, seeing her again was great, and I met Amrita and Paula. So it just became, you know, the urgency of the moment and the particularity of the moment was what animated why we wanted to say something. Right, that was a. It, it it just felt like a different kind of moment and war that we needed to talk about in a particular way. Wouldn't you say, Marita? Yes, very much so. So maybe I can just ask another question, actually, that's directly um, related related to that, because I think that you know, since September 11, there have been various conversations about whether this constituted a global event, right? Um, uh, you know, how one understands it as a, a, a understands it as a global event. Um, you know, in, in, in some, you know, some people have actually theorized what an event is, in fact, in relation to, to September 11, thinking of it as a, as a kind of radical change in the way in which we understand continuities and discontinuities, et cetera. Um, uh, but, um, but, you know, one might say, um, you know, particularly in the context that we're in at the moment, um, uh, uh, how, how does one assess the significance of something like September 11th when we've now had a global pandemic, pandemic when, you know, the, the earthquake in Japan actually changed the access of the planet. You know, I mean there there you know the the the, the question of scale is um uh, um uh so um so fascinating in trying to think about whether something is a global event or not. And now 20 years on from that moment that of course coincides with 20 years of of, of meridians um uh how do you understand that? Do you still think of it as a kind of in, in that way that you were just talking about in the bar, as 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 something that shifted seemed as if it was going to shift the discourse um, uh, somewhat? Maybe maybe you can just both reflect on that. Well, I'll I'll pick up that question, Ranji, in the wonderful way that you presented it. Uh, and to think about it in both continuities and discontinuities, right? One way is it is to understand it as American empire that continues but shifts in its, the way that it, it wages its, its wars around the world, right? Um, and to my mind, looking back 20 years on, what I think is really critical about it is the way that it inaugurated a new mode of power through this anti-terrorism, um, logic of anti-terrorism. And that anti-terrorism has allowed the US to exert power around the world in very different ways. Now, this doesn't mean that it was global in the way that it 
that every nation felt it in the same way. But many, many countries came to deal with their own internal, produce their inter internal others through this mode of anti-terrorism. Now, we all, I mean, in some ways, we always have to remember that terrorism is, anti-terrorism is not a new term either. It, it's a kind of long history of that as well. And in, in a place where we all know, um, South Asia and India, the kind of logic of, you know, the internal uh, others, the militant, the extremists, the terrorists came much before 9-11. So it wasn't the U.S. that started it. But what did happen was it allowed different authoritarians around the world to repress as others in the name of anti-terrorism and to take a lot of money and military hardware and software from the United States in the, in the, uh, with the goal of stamping out terrorism. So I think it's been really uh, 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 a kind of, it's inaugural, it's helped a lot of authoritarian regimes around the world to repress protests in their countries as well. And it's allowed, uh, I think, a particular mode of securitization in all of these countries, but also a, a kind of American, the logic of US power uh, in a different way. So Thanks, Indipal. Thank you, Ranji, for the great question and Indipal for the wonderful opening remarks. So I'm struck, of course, that this is both the 20th anniversary celebration of Meridians, but it's also the 20th year of the U.S. war against Afghanistan, right? So September 11, 2021, the U.S. plans finally to withdraw troops, making this the longest war the U.S. has ever fought. We hadn't anticipated that at the time that we wrote, but we did imagine when we were writing that this was going to be a long war with very lasting legacies. And I'm struck in some ways about how, with how history repeats itself as Biden was considering um, the withdrawal of troops, many lawmakers and many military officials were advising Biden not to withdraw troops because it would lead to increased victimization of women, that the U.S. should remain in Afghanistan to protect women's interests. And how familiar are those arguments, right? And, you know, I, I think those arguments in some ways are plausible ones, although they're not ones that I agree with. Under the U.S. occupation, there has been some improvement in some women's education, employment opportunities, health, but it's only a relatively small group of women and I think the bigger lesson that we would, we should draw from this is that, as Indipal has argued in other work, humanitarianism and war, or the national security state, um, don't make good companions. They're, they're antithetical to one another. Um, has come out of this war is extraordinary cost to human lives of 100,000 people at least, Afghans killed and some 2,000 US troops but also prolonged instability. So it may be the case that women will be victims of the Taliban um, seizing power or a continued civil war, but nonetheless, US presence has not brought about the empowerment of Afghan women. Um, but beyond that, in terms of legacies, I would say that 9-11 um, did introduce a kind of, um, justification for militarization domestically and with respect to the U.S. exercise of power in the world. Um, there's a special issue of Science Magazine in which Cynthia Enloe talks a little bit about this, about how those regimes that were seeking um, justification, discursive justification for their actions, could find it in the war against terrorism. And so we find today, I think, um, so many reverberations of this. It's just very striking to me that in many countries in the world where there has been a growth of the global right and where right-wing populists have come to power, um, they have get engaged in Islamophobic attacks on Muslim populations. And very often they've justified those around um, engendered ways, the Muslim male as terrorist, uh, predator, marauder, and the Muslim woman as victim. 
And it's also striking, and, and Sarah Faris has written about this and others have as well, that in many countries, in France, in the Netherlands, in Italy, and in India, of course, one of the claims that strong arm leaders make is that they are protecting or saving Muslim women. Again, so resonant. Um, with that said, clearly there are some important changes, and I go back to Indrapal's question about sort of continuities and discontinuities. Um, and one of the most striking changes, I think, is that um, it's very hard for the U.S. to claim itself as exceptional if exceptionalism connotes uh, the kind of um, champion of liberal values, democracy, and human rights, uh, given the era of Trumpism. Um, it, uh, to the contrary, what we saw during this period is actually that Trump, through his alliances with right-wing authoritarian leaders actually helped to promote this brand of right-wing populism. Um, and I'll just make one final point, which we can come back to and elaborate on more, is that I, I think it's really important for us to think both about similarities, but also about transnational differences in the ways in which repression is exercised. And perhaps we'll talk more about that. Definitely, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that's so striking about the archive that you put together is, is the variety of different kinds of texts that, um, that you included here. So there's, so there's, there's the letter from Women in Black, there's the, um, there's the statement um, from Rawa, um, uh, the revolutionary activist, um, uh, um, the Women's Association from Afghan uh, 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 Afghanistan. There's a there's kind of a, the manifesto that sort of that's included also in the um, in the in the twentieth century um, uh, volume that was that was written by um, by well I'm calling it a manifesto. It actually presents itself as a statement by Paula Bachetta Tina Kant. Um, in the Paul, Karen Kaplan, Minu Moalam, and Jennifer Terry, um, uh, and um, and poetry, um, and so I, you know, I'm I'm curious um, to to hear your thoughts on the different the nature of the different kind of writing um, that you included in the archive. Um, uh, it's all by women, right? It's all about. September 11th. Um, it's all very, very different, um, uh, and um, uh, it, it, it's interesting to think of it as um, as already a missing archive, if you like, at the moment that you put it together. Um, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit about the different kinds of writing that you included there. Um, you know, how how is it that we think of poetry alongside the statement, um, uh, the letter alongside the sort of the manifesto. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Amrita, do you want to go first? You go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I, I guess it was, uh, for us, it was important to, to have those different kinds of writing just because um, quite often they present very different modes of engagement with the moment as well and and how and the kinds of voices some are very collective some are very individual that was really um, important to us to think about at that moment the the kind of collectivity to present a kind of collectivity but also to present the poet and I am always struck by how important, you know, poetry is to every moment of protest that we see, whether it's in song, whether it's online, or, or where, whether it's at a political rally, or what, you know, poetry seems to be very, very critical um, to expressing something about the moment, to catching that that feeling and that 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 kind of idea of that, that moment. Uh, and that felt so different in one way, how it feels, that felt moment. I think what, you know, Raymond Williams, that structure of feeling that it would catch uh, would be really important. Uh, and so I 
we tried. I mean, there are many genres we did not include for you know a variety of material and uh, other reasons as well. We don't have artwork. We don't have lots of other genres of writing, um, and so it, it, it's always the other thing is always what one can gather at a particular moment comes comes immediately to hand at what you can do, and so. In that sense, I think it's an activist moment where you gather up whatever you can at a particular moment in time to make the, the strongest kind of argument that you can for what feels so different about what's going on. And I think there was a combination of um, uh, material reasons, the kind of gathering of what we had and what we thought was important to present and the variety, the kinds of voices, variety of voices we wanted to bring to the discussion. Uh, I think that that, looking back, that that mix, as much as one can look back, that mix was what felt right to us, you know, however um, different each of them were in terms of what they were doing and what they were trying to say and how they were saying it, you know. To pick up on this last song, just um, this past year, there's an extraordinary protest organized largely by Muslim women in Shaheen Bagh, Delhi, against the Citizenship Amendment Act, um, which of course you're both familiar with, the Modi government's attempt to um, really rewrite India's citizenship laws to deny citizenship rights to Muslim immigrants, but it has very important complications for Mus implications for Muslim citizens. And what struck me about the protest is how animated it was by poetry, by song, by art, by cultural forms of expression. And that just seems so true of so many protest movements that we've seen over the years, and often especially those that are organized by women or ones in which women play an important role. There's a kind of gendering of protest, I think, that goes beyond simply the manifesto statements of demands to also include these other more affective forms of dissent. And I think that's what the archive reflected as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you for that. Um, thanks for that response. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting to think of today because I think that we're very much, um, maybe especially in the US, I'm not sure um, about this, but we're very much sort of in the age of the statement, you know, um, uh, when I think about all the statements that so many of us put out around um, the murder of George Floyd, for example, um, from university contexts all the way to big corporations, etc., just trying to sort of understand the different kinds of registers of the statement um, uh, and how we how we think of that in relation to scholarly work is something that I think is is kind of fascinating at the moment. And, and uh, towards the end of your, um, of your editorial um, statement uh, for the Feminist Archive, for the September 11th Feminist Archive, you say, um, and I'm going to quote you here, no doubt there are important pieces and voices that we have not included here. In the effort to provide a timely intervention, we have had to work fast in order to make publication deadlines. We also realized that some pieces might be, appear to be somewhat rough and unpolished, but that is to be expected of statements that were written in urgent response to a rapidly changing situation. Despite these concerns, we offer this collection of writings as a testimony to the nuanced, thoughtful, and important analyses that women and feminists offered in response to the events of September 11, 2001. And I'm wondering if you could, if you could maybe um, comment a little bit on this question of the urgent um, in relation to the scholarly, as it were. Um, uh, how is it that um, that 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 one understands um, uh, the 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 way in which that idea of the urgent is framed? Um, uh, uh, an immediate demand, a necessity of responding in relation to the kind of slow time of scholarly work that most of us um, in universities anyway are involved in. Um, uh, could you maybe just sort of comment on that, 
on that different kind of mode, as it were, of of writing, of thinking about time and and responsiveness, for example. It's such a good question, Ranji, and one that I really grapple with because so many of the questions that I um, write about are sort of compelled by a sense of urgency and the moment quickly changes and our analyses of those moments change as well. So um, I don't have a good answer to it. I mean, I think in part your question also touches on um, the relationship between the activist imperative and the scholarly imperative. The urgency often comes out of an activist one. And I don't have an answer as to how we should find that balance other than to say that um, that moment, that sense of urgency is still with us. And I think it's with us more than ever. The particular issues have changed. But in the US and in so many countries, um, there has been an attack on higher education, there's been an attack on liberal arts, there's been an attack on the humanities, there's been an attack on scholars who speak out about Palestine, about other issues. Their voices have been silenced. That was true when we put together our archive as well, and it's something we speak about. Um, and to me, it seems, although, you know, this is, of course, incredibly, um, in, incredibly worrisome, the, the kind of crisis of higher education that's being linked to a, that's linked to a political crisis. In some ways, it also suggests that the chasm between the ivory tower of the university or the ivory tower of women's studies and um, what's happening on the streets, that that chasm has narrowed a bit. Um, that issues are, are, we are being presented with issues to which we must respond. Um, I see that at Amherst now and at other college campuses, particularly around issues to do with anti-racism. You know, the extraordinary impact of police brutality and Black Lives Matter to students, to faculty, and the need for us to make institutional and curricular and pedagogical changes that address racism. Um, I see that in the need for us to mobilize in support of colleagues, in, whether they're in um, Russia or in Turkey or in India who are coming under uh, increasing state repression. Um, and also I see how so many new people, I mean, if we were to write this archive today, we would have an even harder time than we did knowing how many, just being able to address the whole range of groups that are bringing kind of intellectual concerns to bear on uh, political questions from Black Lives Matter to violence against women to, you know, the extraordinary um, demonstration of opposition to the military in Myanmar uh, or to the Modi government in India. So I, I think those examples are there of people who are engaging in political activism, which is informed by serious and rigorous thought to which we as academics must respond with a sense of urgency, even if sometimes it's rough. Our thinking is rough and in process and incomplete. I'll add to that by saying that, you know, in some ways, it is a, a kind of long temporality of research that allows you to grasp a moment in a particular way, right? And as feminists, that way of studying the state, patriarchy, gender, all those structures of power allowed us, and the study of long histories of imperialism brought that together and allowed us to see something in a particular moment that in that moment, it contained a potentiality of the past and the future in a new way, right? So it allowed us to see that in a particular way. And I will say temporalities are something that we always deal with because the temporality of research and of publication are so different in some ways. You know, the, well, it just takes so long uh, to do a, a kind of research and then when it comes out, you it, it has a sense of belatedness to that research process that is really always something we, we, we all think about uh, in some way or we all, all understand in some way or the other. But I think the, the question of Afghanistan and 9-11 was particularly resonant 
if you know that history of that region itself, and it's very long history of wars, right? And so it, it, it isn't like there's a 20 year 9-11 and this moment means 20 years of war in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has been in war for over 50 years. That region has had imperial wars and the US intervention when the Soviets went to Afghanistan. And so you've had interventions for a really long time. And so the question of thinking about feminism and the rescue of Afghan women was also particularly resonant through that understanding that the US had been at war for so long and that women, the question of women had never come up during that time. And it was only at 9-11 and after that it was being raised as a kind of humanitarian justification, right? For the war, right? So, so temporality is, is a really key issue to think about in terms of not just how we think about how long the American wars have been. I think about the American wars have been way longer than 20 years, you know. Thank, thanks very much for that. I mean, I think, I think um, uh, you know, 20, 20 years ago already there was this massive population difference, right, in, in Afghanistan. I believe I think it, it it was maybe 70% of the population was women 65 to 70% already as a result of as a result of the long wars right and um uh, um i i think you know, one of the things that we're seeing today that actually and this came up in an in a different panel i think yesterday or maybe maybe the day i think yesterday um in the morning yesterday um that once again now we don't see women at the table at all in thinking about what it might what it might mean for um for, for the us to withdraw um from, from afghanistan um and um and and in a sense i mean to, to my mind it makes it makes uh, um, this archive all the more all the more important all the more poignant um uh, um, in, in a sense that that we it, it's just so very clear it's so very clear the the um the the thing that we were calling out at that time so many of us were calling out I and mean, there was a um, sign special issue as well or a section of a special issue that was also on september the 11th that i i contributed to and i was looking back at that too but also you know just calling out at that time already you know, how women were being left out, how apparently there was a women's ministry being set up, and yet there were no telephones given to it to it. You know, I mean, all, all those sorts of things that we 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 had both predicted and um uh um uh and and reg and and regretted as well, right? Because of course one you know one one inevitably hopes that there will be I mean of necessity, right? There, one hopes that there will be a difference made. Even as one recognizes the the, um, the the almost inevitable fact that there will not be a difference made for women um, in in the um, in the in the naming of women as 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 as, a, as an excuse in a sense for war. Um, so um, so I'm wondering if you might if you might actually say something about. Um, a, uh, about how we actually might think about this 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 question of how there are still no women at the table here. Um, uh, what has changed? What has changed? Has there, have things only deteriorated um, in, um, in in the way in which we might grapple with that 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 question of what's going on there? And I know I know that both of you sort of work more. Um, in India than you do in Afghanistan and um, and the US also. So I know that this isn't necessarily your area of focus, but if you could, if you might just give us a way of thinking through this this issue, um, has nothing changed um, or has something changed? Um, uh, how do we, um, I was struck yesterday, Angela Davis um, in, in, in the panel that she was in yesterday, is, was saying we have to 
we have to act as if there is a possibility of change, right? And we have to act for what we want. Um, but how does one do that um, when it seems as if there's, there's there are these blows? Right? Has 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 something? To well, I I'll, I'm happy to to go first at that question. I think at some level we all say, well, you know, we expected this. You know, learning. You know, so in some ways, we think militarism is still uh, a kind of a way to produce a certain kind of masculinity, right? And so it inevitably does. Um, and what we've seen, what we often, I think, what is always striking to me is how when we talk about there are no women at the table, but there are American women at the table, if not at the table, if not in the Trump administration, most certainly in the Biden. We have to remember that the head of the CIA was a woman, even during in the Trump years, right? So there are women at what, you know, a table of power, if not in the optics that are shown in the newspaper meetings with the Taliban or whatever. Uh, but there are women, and that is an that has been really interesting to me what i've called security feminism is the kind of rise of a certain kind of militarized uh, uh imperial empowerment of women through participation in in the military and i think of it is in terms of the the language of you know the language of equity the language of empowerment of the u.s military itself it's called for diversity all so it that is certainly something we need to pay attention to as feminists and what is going on in the name of feminism. And I think we always forget to think about the gender of the structure of power of the state. And we look at the, the groups that are being uh, targeted as uh, the targets of reform and look at the gender component of them. We don't look at the gender component of the groups that are doing the 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 work of power exercising power and i always want to think about which states and which powers are gendered and how do we think about the state itself and not just the, the kind of uh, the groups that are in the discussion at the moment and if you look at many many countries around the world i mean the trump administration if you looked at the component of the most of the cabinet and most of it itself, was all men too it wasn't that it, there weren't that many women in it. And the women that were, we have learned as feminists, we have to think cautiously about some women. We don't always uh, want to say that all women are part of this anti-war effort or an anti-imperial effort. We certainly cannot uh, discount the work of uh, white supremacy and women in it as well. So I think that that, that is something that can change. Which women are at which table and from where is an important question I'd like to bring to the table. The other women who were there in Afghanistan were women in the NGOs doing the kind of on the ground work and often, often ignored by the US government, often not given as many resources. But a lot of them, uh, a lot of women did this you know, the the Kabul modeling school, there was a book on the model a school for makeup in Kabul. It was a lot of sort of cultural feminism, not feminism, sort of a, a, a kind of empowerment of women through all kinds of product, participation in consumption that was encouraged by the US government as well. And a lot of women made their careers by sort of the old, imperial mode of the white savior complex, participation in the white savior complex that went sort of crazy at the moment. So that was very powerful uh, also. So yes, there were women at the table, which table and which women are always important to answer. Um, but of course the Taliban, I, I mean, as Amrita said, you know, it's it's been very, um, uh, 
important to see where women gained any kinds of power and very sporadically and who allowed them for long stretches of time the US uh, 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 authorities in Afghanistan didn't care very much for what the feminists were doing right and so we know that that uh, the, the kind of language that was used really didn't match up with what was happening on the ground. It's struck by the fact that there's been an explosion of literature on populism and on right-wing populism um, in the past years, as we've seen the growth of right-wing populism in so many regions of the world. And yet its understanding of gender and how populism is gendered, I think is really very thin. Um, or women's roles. I mean, there's some literature that talks about how women, um, when they acquire leadership of populist parties, um, soften the images of those parties through femininity and maternalism and so on. But I think um, that we need a much deeper understanding of, of this whole question and of a deeper understanding of why it is that increasingly larger numbers of women have voted for right-wing populist parties. Some of them have become leaders of these parties, whether to soften the image or to or not um, remains a different question. Um, and why, how, how it is that, um, whether it's supremacist groups or um, Hindutva, Hindu nationalist groups, they've attracted the attention of women from majority communities. Um, of course, this is also very defined by class, by ethnicity, race, religion, and so on. It's not all women, but there is a group of women that has been attracted to the right. And I think we have to, we have to make better sense of why that's happened and how also um, right-wing populists can very effectively use gender, um, not just the aura of masculinity, but sometimes more complex gendered messages in order to attract the support of women. So I think to go back, Ranji, to your question, yes, I think there is something really concerning about the ways in which some women, it's a small minority of women, exercise power when they achieve it, but also how many women are absent from decision-making roles. Um, where I find hope, I think, is that there was a period of time in which many feminists were very wary of electoral power and of, you know, really insisted on maintaining autonomy from political parties in the state. And that's begun to change, particularly at the local level. I think you see in the US, but also in many other parts of the world, women seeking electoral office, running for elections, supporting and joining political parties and beginning to have a real impact on, um, on local politics. What, of course, has been much more challenging is to think about how that translates into national power and national political office. And that just has not happened as much yet. And that, I think, is, um, you know, one of the real challenges. And, and I think one challenge for us to think about is where is feminism today? How would feminists describe the activities of these women? You know, feminist, feminism has always been a contested term. Many women activists who are engaged in pro-democracy struggles, anti-militarization, don't necessarily describe themselves as feminists, even though they're doing work that we might think of as being feminists. So what are the kinds of coalitions that can be built to support these kinds of women, co coalitions, which I think are occurring, but might, might occur even more? Thanks very much. Um both of you, you to that, and maybe maybe we can just sort of take up that point around transnational coalitions, um, uh, partly as a way to think about whether that term transnational has changed um, over the last twenty years. Um, I feel like um, uh, um, I, I was looking at the uh, at Kumkum Bhavnani's um, uh, editorial um, introduction to the volume that. That, that your uh, um, pieces were included in, but also um, uh, um, just thinking about um, how in the statement by um, Indapal and others, the transnational feminist practices against war, in a sense, there's, a, there's, there's an attempt also to work out what, it, what we mean by transnational there. Um, uh, and it's, it's interesting to me to think about how one understands that right now. Um, Amrita, I mean, I, I know that you've been working on the, um, on the protests um, in India, um, 
uh, uh, many of many of uh, many of which were by women, and in fact, women were very much a kind of public face of the protests, um, particularly Muslim women. In fact, um, of course, against the, um, the changes in the the, the, the citizen, citizenship amendment act. Um, uh, in the Pal, I'm also interested in 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 how you you think about the way in which, for example, um, one might think of transnational feminism in relation to the, the image of, of, of the woman in the protests, um, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protests, uh, Black Lives Matter pro protests um, in the US. Um, uh, um, you know, I think that, that we have all these images of women um, uh, um, at this moment that have been very important, holding up the hands for handcuffs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm wondering if you could actually just think it a little bit in terms of um, your own work on how one understands the transnational um, uh, right now in relation to women and women's protests. Well, I, I've just been reading this wonderful book by Catherine Sameh about this very topic, about Iran women, um, Iranian women and the networks of protest that they participated in. And she lays out how um, so many of women in Iran, uh, as they protest against the government and against even now the sanctions have participated in all kinds of networks around the world because of the history of Iran that so many had to leave after the revolution. So in an inescapably, this is what happens. And that's the government in Iran, and Catherine lays out. Uh, uh, further uh, puts women in jail or exiles women and doesn't allow them to enter that kind of transnational diasporic, here in this sense, diasporic network becomes really important for people uh, to participate in. Of course, we know the complexities of, of activism transnationally, right? Because you have to think about what it is for people to participate in particular spaces might also differ, you know? Um, to that extent, the, the as we wrote, one of the things we tried to say you know, uh, in the work I did with Karen Kaplan was to think about transnational practices and not just transnational feminism, right? To, to, to kind of think about the term as, you know, how feminists engaged in doing something. It's the history of doing what they do matters, not, not the kind of identity formation itself as a transnational feminism. And I think I stick to that a bit to think about um, what is it that we do as diasporic people? And one one sort of interesting mode of participation in in protests transnationally has become this global petition, which I am very taken by. Sort of the ways in which we all sign on to these online petitions from all over the world, no matter where it is actually happening. So. So we're all finding ways in this, even in this pandemic virtual year, to be able to support some people, to be in solidarity, to provide some kind of presence. And of course, the world of social media, where a lot of activism happens also virtually, that activism, uh, transnational activism has become you know, vital there in those spaces as well. Uh, of course, in many parts of the world, the, the kind of idea of transnational uh, theory that we were talking about came also because of a different way of thinking about the state and people and everyone has always been mobile, that we were never to think about about a kind of epistemology of, of something being settled. Um, and to that extent, I think that if we think about a world of mobility, if we think of migrants as the norm, not the anomaly, we will be much better off in this world. And that I will, you know, I, I, I think what has changed is the urgency of thinking about a world of mobility and migration that is now 
what so many millions, if not billions, are participating, whether it's wars or climate change or whatever, we have to think about the world and national boundaries in very different ways. Thank you. I must admit, I'm feeling rather bleak about the possibilities of progressive transnational activism these days for a number of reasons. One is um, I, like I'm sure many of us, am just devastated by news from India about the pandemic. And what and I don't know what an appropriate activist response is when it's clear that this is a problem that is created by the actions and inactions of the government, but it's also a structural issue, which reflects, you know, radically, vastly inadequate public health care systems, the government's failure to invest in them. And, and as we've seen, you know, in so many parts of the world, the people who are dying in largest numbers are poor people of color and women of color or women from minority communities. But what is an activist response? You know, this is one in which um, we might find ways of sending, uh, you know, doing fundraising and talking to each other about the situation. But I, I for one, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm also, I think, depressed about the idea that the transnational right has so much stronger connections than the transnational left. And yet the transnational right is also varied in some ways. You know, it, across the world, transnational right wing regimes are embedded in um, or committed to xenophobic forms of nationalism, but they vary in other ways. You know, some of them, Duterte's Philippines is anti-American, others like Modi are pro-American. You know, it's not a straight axis in terms of where you place them with respect to their relationship to imperialism or range of other things. So, um, you know, for all of those reasons, I just find it harder to think in many instances about what an effective transnational response is. With that said, I guess one thing I feel is that it's more and more imperative that we as scholars um, use our voices and writing to inform and to communicate ideas to broader audiences. And I say that with a great aspiration and desire to do so, but I'm really bad at doing it. I wish I knew how to write differently rather than writing for you know the 10 people that I usually write for in sort of academic writing. Um, and I, but I guess the other, um, I think, imperative of transnational activism is the one that Indipal referred to, and that is um, displaying solidarity among people, not trying to articulate for them or influence what their demands should be, but the petition. And that just seems to me, even though it's the least we can do, at least it's something. It is a way of a statement and supporting struggles and calling attention to um, the extent to which people are being subject to really brutal repression. Can I add just to that really quickly? Um, I think um, the transnational activism around the pandemic, which has been to put pressure on the Biden administration to release the vaccines and to push for uh, breaking the patents that pre prevent uh, the production of the vaccines from around the world, and also to allow the US government to release materials to make the vaccines will yeah. are really important. So I think what we do here in the US and what we do around the world to pressure governments to do the right thing seems to me to be vital and critical now, right? And even, you know, when I think of conditions in South Asia, one thing I will note from sort of doing recent work in in uh, Punjab is that, you know, you look at the farmers' protest and there are ways in which the, pro the question of food production is a global process. We have to think about the kind of participation of corporations, the ways in which over four decades of neoliberalism has changed the world. And, we, and that seems to me a place where it's not so much solidarity, but it's also kind of understanding how we all participated in, in kind of making something that we need to kind of recognize. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to both of you. We are actually um, uh, beyond our time, in fact. Um,
But I just want to say a big thank you to, to both of you, both for the both for the archive and also for the conversation today. Um, the next panel is starting um, right now, in fact, in a minute from now, um, and is uh, with Kunkun Bhavnani and Daphne Brooks um, uh, of Soul Singing and Masala Beyond the Trauma of Displacement. That session will, will start shortly. Um, but I just want to say a big thank you again, um, Indapal and Amrita, for, um, for this conversation today and for the work that you continue to do and started doing um, uh, all, all, all those years ago and, uh, and was so, so important in the shaping of the kinds of conversations that we have in Meridians. Thank you. Thanks, Ranji, for a wonderful conversation and questions. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Janetta and Megan and all the organizers.